Hi there. So we're getting into agriculture today and I've had a lot of coffee. So here we go. All right. Now I'll try to be relatively subdued. Um, so anyway, yes, today we're going to look, go over some points on agriculture and food networks. And, you know, because of the nature of what we've got going on with online teaching this semester and because of all the other things kind of filling our heads and disrupting us, some of you may have noticed it's a little difficult to concentrate uh, these days. And so one of the things that I've done is I've stripped down a lot of these presentations to really focus on just a couple of the main points. Um, you know, I recognize that not only do we have a lot of material that's hard to kind of digest online, I also recognize that honestly, there's a lot going on in the world with our own private lives and things in the larger, you know, kind of world that are, you know, pulling our attention away. So I'm going to try to be succinct, try to keep it to things that hopefully are also valuable things to think about in terms of the context of what the world is like today. Um, so anyway, without uh, further ado, let's launch into this. So today we're going to talk about global food networks and agriculture. And this has become particularly important right now because obviously um, a lot of the things around globalization and the linking of different places is kind of fraying and coming apart a little bit, right? As countries are kind of getting more of a bunker mentality and cutting off some of those interconnections. But it's important to note, you know, in terms of the context of globalization really being a process that's gone on really for hundreds of years, is that a lot of the things around what we eat and what we grow has been the product of a lot of movement and interconnection. So let me just give an example. If you think about Italian food and what's kind of a traditional Italian food, you might think about something like pasta with red sauce, right? Like a tomato-based sauce. That's sometimes what we think of when we think of Italian food. But if you think about what actually that's made out of, noodles. Noodles are not from Italy, right? Noodles are from China. But then were imported into Italy, and then people in Italy started making those. And also tomatoes. Tomatoes did not exist in Europe until they were from the New World. And so until Columbus and other explorers came over to the New World and then started bringing back some of these products to Europe, there was no tomato sauce in Italy. And so even if it's something that we think about as being kind of an ethnic cuisine of a particular place is usually kind of a combination of things that actually came from somewhere else. Another good example would be, say, uh, Ireland and potatoes, right? We usually think of potatoes kind of being associated with Ireland, but that's not where potatoes are from. Potatoes are from the Andes in South America. And so until European explorers came over, got the, the potato and then brought it back to Europe, prior to that, the potatoes did not exist in Ireland. And so that wasn't really a part of the diet. So some of these things that we think about being very much uh, the cuisines of these particular places are actually the result of globalization. And so uh, of this kind of intermixing and interconnection. And so it's important to think about how that has affected kind of what has come to be in terms of our food systems and our agricultural systems. But then also we should think about in the context of today, what it means when we rely on these global networks of food supply and that that's kind of uh, changing and fraying a little bit as, as uh, um, you know, as countries tend to uh, kind of cut off some of those interconnections right now. All right. So one of the main themes too here is that idea that, you know, agriculture started in certain places all around the world at about the same time, between seven to 8,000 years ago in places like the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East, but also in China and in Africa and in parts of the Americas here too. But even though that's where agriculture started, those are not necessarily the most productive agricultural areas of the world, which you can see in green here, which is today mostly in the kind of slightly moderate climates like you get here in the United States, Europe, China, India, South America, Australia. Um, those tend to be the most kind of productive agricultural regions today. The other thing that kind of characterizes modern food systems is that we're incredibly globalized and interconnected. If you've ever tried to get strawberries in the middle of winter, the reason you can do that is because they were grown in some place like Chile and then shipped here. Um, and so uh, a lot of food products that are made in a particular place are not usually eaten close to that place. Um, I don't have figures for New Hampshire in terms of what percentage of our foods that we eat are imported, but I do know when I lived on the Big Island of Hawaii, which is a very agriculturally rich and productive place all year round, uh, 
only about 10% of the food consumed on the island came from the island. 90% came from somewhere else that was then brought there. And I think that's probably fairly similar in a lot of places where what you eat is not usually grown nearby. And so this is important today as we're thinking about global supply chains and disruptions to global supply chains because people uh, you know, may be getting sick or you know, certain uh, industries are not running and operating whether that be the people growing the food, the people kind of canning or processing the food, the people transporting the food, what other kinds of restrictions may be on transport, can lead to some disruptions in the supply chain. Um, as of this recording, you know, one of the things that's been going on, of course, is that if you go to the grocery store, you'll notice some empty shelves and some things that are missing. But a lot of that's just because of a kind of a spurt of demand that has caused panic buying from most reports, the supply chain of producing food materials, food and other materials, is actually still fine. The, the you know some of the factories that produce things like for Heinz uh, products and others say that they've been going like three shifts, you know, uh, every day, really producing a lot of stuff. Um, and so that right now we don't actually have a problem with supply. That could change if things get kind of more severe in different places or if there are more restrictions on trade. But for now. Um, you know, it, it seems like there's not really a huge disruption, but we're certainly seeing some things that are more difficult to get. As some parts of the world start kind of recovering from the outbreak, like for instance in China, now that it seems to be sort of uh, lessening, like those places will start becoming more productive again, putting things out. The question is, is you know, is that is the trade still happening between China and these other areas and, get, and moving those products around? But the production in China should start ramping up here. Okay, um, so in general, of course, agriculture is really important because all humans depend on it directly or indirectly to eat and survive. And this definition of agriculture is important here. It's the cultivation of domesticated crops and the raising of domesticated animals. And the key words here is cultivation or raising. This is not like gathering or say like, for instance, fishing doesn't really count as agriculture because you're just going out and getting what's already out there in the natural world. Or if you went out berry picking, that's not really agriculture either. Agriculture is a plan, right? It's about cultivating. You put seeds in the ground, you tend to them, you harvest them, and then you eat them. And so um, it is more than just sort of like stuff growing. It's sort of stuff growing in a planned way that humans are kind of directly involved in the cultivation of this. And agriculture remains really the most important economic activity in the world. It uses more land than any other activity, and it employs about 40% of the working population of the world. That said, in the United States, only about 5% of our population works in agriculture, so we tend to think that there's not as many people working in agriculture, but that's because other countries have much higher percentages of their workforce in agriculture, and because our agriculture is heavily mechanized, and so we don't have as many people working in that industry. And this is a good quote that I like. It's, uh, it says, despite all our accomplishments, we owe our existence to a six inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. Basically true, right? I mean, doesn't all the stuff that we talk about in this class in terms of politics and culture and economics, none of that happens unless we're feeding people and people can eat. Now, as true as this saying is, you can take a look here at who's saying this, the Farm Equipment Association of Minnesota and South Dakota. So clearly they have a little bit of a vested interest in making it sound like agriculture is the most important thing, but eh, it's hard to argue that it isn't. And, you know, as mentioned, not only are a lot of people employed in it, about 37% of the world's land area is cultivated or pastured, used for human consumption in agriculture. Back when we talked about population, we talked about this idea of human appropriation of net primary productivity and how we've been able to actually increase agricultural production even as our global population has increased. The way we've done that is by converting almost 40% of the planet to growing food for us. Yeah. So there's a couple different uh, ways to think about agriculture. And this is one of the main points that I wanted to make here. One is that agriculture can be thought of as extensive or intensive. Extensive is when something's going on over a large area, but you're not necessarily expand, expending a lot of labor per square foot, per acre, that sort of thing. So like ranching. If you just let cattle out, say somewhere in the West, and let them run all over the forest and eat, you're using a lot of land, but not a lot of labor and not a lot of money per acre 
to produce beef in that way. Intensive, on the other hand, means you try to get as much out of a small area as possible. So you use a lot of labor, you might use fertilizers and pesticides and a lot of water, and you try to get as much out of one spot as you possibly can. So things like, say, corn farming would be an example of very intensive agriculture. You're trying to get a lot out of every single acre. Now, you might be doing this over a very, very large area, but you're still trying to get a lot out of each one and using a lot of labor. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here slide-wise because there's a good example for... Um, <clears throat> for looking at intensive agriculture. So my example of if you let cattle just run all over the place, that's extensive. Intensive would be using feedlots, which is what this looks like. And if you've ever had the displeasure of driving past a feedlot, you know that they smell horrible. The ecological damage that happens here when you pack a bunch of cows together is pretty bad. Obviously, it doesn't make for very happy cows either. And essentially what happens is, is this is a fattening operation where cattle are put here, they're fed a bunch of corn and soybeans and a bunch of water. Their waste products are all concentrated in one area. It's a very intensive way to raise beef. And it's actually how most beef in the United States is raised, is in this very intensive feedlot kind of production system. So that's that difference between extensive and intensive types of agriculture. Okay, so that being said, um, I want to look at a couple of different types of agriculture here, just so that people have a feel for like the way in which food is produced in very different ways in different places. Um, and the first and kind of one of the original ways that humans did agriculture is what's called Swidden cultivation. And people still do this all over the world. It's also known as uh, shifting cultivation or sometimes as slash and burn agriculture. And the idea is that you go into a place, you cut down the forest, you go in and you plant your stuff in that area because, well, you cut down the forest and you burn it, and that puts a lot of the nutrients from the forest into the soil. So you can grow stuff pretty well, but only for about five years or so. And then the soil starts to be depleted. And then you have to go somewhere else, cut down more forest, burn it, and then start the process over again. And usually when people do that, you do something called intercropping, which means you plant a bunch of different kinds of plants kind of all mixed together. It's not, there's the opposite of intercropping is monocropping, where you're just planting one thing, like say corn over the whole area. Intercropping is you might put some corn and some beans and some peas and some squash and whatever, um, and kind of put it all together. Now this form of cultivation actually has some pretty positive uh, kind of things associated with it. For one, People have been doing this for thousands of years and can be sustainable if you have enough land and few enough people in an area. And that's key because if you do this and you have enough room to then go to a next spot and do slash and burn and then go to a next spot and the next, and there's enough land and few enough people that you can come back around after say 30 years or so to a place that you had been 30 years prior, let the forest grow back up then you could cut it down, you could burn it, and then replant, then it's actually a sustainable system. If, however, you have too many people or not enough land, it can become very environmentally destructive because if you're not letting the land have the time to kind of regrow the forest and lay fallow and regenerate that soil, then you just kind of degrade the whole area. And one of the key things too here is one of the other cons here of Sweden cultivation is that in poor countries, sometimes people come in and start with Sweden cultivation, then later they'll bring in cattle or then other kinds of crops like soybeans and monocrop things. And then it can create this kind of slide towards kind of degradation and non-sustainable use. But the pros, if you don't kind of have that situation, if you have like enough land and not enough people and, and a little, small amount of people, it's sustainable. It actually increases biodiversity because whenever you're disrupting or like cutting down some of the larger forests and making these open patches, other species that normally couldn't grow under a forest canopy can start growing. And so you actually have more species in the forest than you would if there wasn't a disturbance or disruption. And also you get a lot of calories for a food for the amount of calories that humans are expending on cultivating. And so it's actually even better than modern agriculture in terms of the amount of Kind of calories you get from it versus the calories you expend. So that said, that's one way of kind of doing agriculture um, and that one of the oldest ones. Another really important one is paddy rice farming. This, is go this goes on particularly in Asia and parts of Africa, the Caribbean, other areas um, where people will, um, you know, essentially flood fields, 
and grow rice. And it's fairly efficient, it's very intensive. You have to use fertilizer, you have to use a lot of water, but you can, with three acres of land, you can usually support an entire family. And um, as this picture sort of shows, this is something that pretty much has to be done communally because there's so many tasks where you have to go through and plant a large area all at one time. You have to be able to flood the fields. In this case, you have to build terraces so that you can do it on a hillside. And you can see that this is not just a family operation. It's really kind of like a whole village kind of operation. Um, but it is a pretty efficient way of growing a lot of food. Another way of growing food is what's sometimes referred to as peasant farming. In the United States, we don't use the word peasant very much. We usually talk about family farmers because, uh, but you know, there's this idea that what a peasant farm is, is it's small scale producers who own their own fields, basically rely on family labor. They produce food to eat for themselves and some food to sell to the market. And often it's associated with a distinct kind of folk culture in these kind of traditional agricultural areas. And uh, this is a fairly popular form of agriculture in many parts of the world, except even not until, until fairly recently, even here in the United States. Again, we didn't call it peasant farming. We call it usually family farms. Like if you've gone to a party recently and asked people, hey, what do you do? Very few people say, oh, I'm a peasant. But you get the idea. They might say, oh, I'm a farmer and I do these things, you know. But um, anyway, uh, this is fairly popular, not only because it produces well and it's fairly secure for the people who do it because you're, supp you're, you're supplying your own food for your family and you're also getting money from selling other things on the market. Um, but people uh, kind of like this lifestyle because there's a lot of autonomy um, in it uh, in terms of being able to make what, you know, nobody's really telling you what to do. You're not working for somebody else, that kind of thing. The opposite of that really is plantation agriculture. That's when you have one landowner who owns a really big area and is just growing one thing and the workers are just paid laborers who are just going and working on the plantation. Or, you know, the history of plantation agriculture is that originally, of course, it was a lot of slave labor being used on plantations, things like tobacco plantations in the American South, sugar plantations in many parts of the world, uh, fruit plantations like banana plantations, coffee plantations, etc. And we still have these around the world today. And what they have in common is they're growing usually one cash crop that's being sold and the people working in it don't really own it. They are just workers. Um, and then there's some owner who's getting most of those proceeds. Okay, just had a brief pause there. Um, so in terms of where we are at, um, so we just talked about the um, information on plantation agriculture, but a couple more types that I wanted to bring up here. One is grain farming, which obviously is very important. This is, you know, wheat, corn, um, those sort of products. And this is, um, you know, these are the kinds of products that are built, or that are uh, produced on really a mass level and then really um, distributed all around the world. And when we look at where a lot of the uh, areas are that uh, produce a lot of grain, particularly like this is an example of wheat, and you can see the United States, Canada, but also Russia, China, India, Australia, those sort of places, Ukraine, pretty big uh, producers of wheat as well. One of the things about grain farming is that these are typically very large farms with the widespread use of machinery, synthetic pesticides and fertilizers, genetically modified seeds, which we'll talk a little bit about here in a second. Um, and this has become incredibly important in terms of feeding the world because, as this uh, slide talks about, the food supply for over 85% of the world's population comes from only 20 species. So corn, wheat, soybeans, right, um, have really uh, a really important role in terms of, uh, you know, what people are eating across the entire world. But one of the things about the production of, uh, of, of grains is that it's led to the rise of what we refer to as suitcase farms. And this is, uh, you know, particularly in American agriculture, where you have a, say there was an area that might have in the past had a lot of family farms. And one of the things that's changed is these places have become more mechanized in terms of, you know, the planting and the harvesting. But also a lot of the land has been bought out by large companies. And so the people that actually lived on the land essentially sell off the, the land itself, they move out of the area. And then these companies just set up what are called suitcase farms where people come in that are uh, laborers with the machinery, they do the planting, then they leave 
And then when it's harvest time, they come back and do the harvest. But in the meantime, nobody actually lives there. Just the workers come at these different times a year, you know, quote, with their suitcases, do the work and then leave. So what this has done is it's created a uh, tremendous amount of depopulation in parts of the uh, Midwest or the Great Plains where a lot of the, uh, these farms are, whereas you might have in the past had people living and working in the area. Now they're not there. And so once those farmers leave and their income leaves, well, then there's nobody to spend money in the local stores all year or to have their kids in the schools, this kind of thing. And so a lot of these communities have really shrank in terms of their population because of this uh, thing called suitcase farms. Um, and then, you know, as mentioned, you know, when I talked about intensive agriculture, livestock fattening is another big one where you're taking hogs or cattle and you're putting them into fairly small areas, feedlots, and just uh, feeding them corn, soybeans, and other kinds of agricultural products and fattening them up in a very intensive way. And again, this is this idea of a feedlot. And this is where a lot of the, uh, you know, meat production or the way meat production is done uh, for the most part in the United States. And then the last type of agriculture I wanted to mention is urban agriculture, which is the raising of, you know, uh, fruits, vegetables, but also meat products and milk within cities. And this has become uh, a little more popular in the United States of late in terms of it being, uh, you know, a little bit trendy for, you know, people to do some urban gardening and that kind of stuff. But in many parts of the world, it's actually really important for the survival of urban residents. So like, for instance, in China, agriculture that happens within urban areas actually produces about 90% of all the vegetables that are consumed in the cities. And so a lot of that's actually grown right there. It's also important in places like West Africa, Cuba, and other areas too. Okay, so that's the stuff about kind of how the different, different things are produced around the world. But, and you know, I've mentioned the fact that also agricultural products move around the world. But of course, the other thing that differs by different parts of the world is the level of malnutrition and availability of food and accessibility. As we talked about in the population section, we know that there's been enough food produced per person and enough calories produced, but the problem is, is that, that people have unequal access to that food, right? And so one of the things you're going to see in some videos associated with this unit uh, are going to focus on Kenya here. And Kenya is a place with very high percentage of their population is undernourished, but as you'll see, that's not because Kenya doesn't grow a bunch of food. Kenya does. The thing is, is that that food tends to be produced for the export market and sent to Europe or the Middle East or other areas instead of feeding Kenyans. And you'll see a little more of that in the videos. So one of the other things that I wanted to mention here is the Green Revolution, because the Green Revolution was this program that really took off in like the 1960s and 70s, um, particularly the 1960s. And the idea between the green, for the Green Revolution was to produce a lot more food so that places that had a lot of food insecurity and malnutrition would produce more. And one of the reasons it's called the Green Revolution is that it was actually supposed to be kind of an economic and political program to counter the Red Revolution, meaning the communist revolutions that were happening. And so in the United States and in other kind of uh, countries that were you know, democratic and, and capitalist, there was a concern that having a lot of hunger in places like India and in Latin America and in Africa was going to get the populations in these areas to turn towards communism and the idea of redistributing the wealth that existed. Well, the Green Revolution was this plan to sort of counter that by saying, well, if people are starving and they don't have enough food, the answer is not to redistribute the food or make it more equal, that what you should do is just produce more food. And the Green Revolution was this was this plan to kind of counter the red revolutions i will say this on an exam somewhere you will see the green revolution giving giving that away right now it is not a revolution of people acting in a more environmentally friendly way because the green revolution was anything but environmentally friendly and the name make make it seem like that but that's not what was happening at all what happened during this uh, green revolution it was the introduction of high yielding hybrid seeds and also coupled with chemical fertilizers and pesticides aimed particularly at Asian agricultural systems in India being really the primary one. But the whole idea was is that a country that didn't have a lot of food or, or had people that were malnourished is that you would buy these seeds that were hybrids. And what a hybrid is is when you take two types of the same plant and you basically breed them together. So let's say you wanted to make corn that was very tall, but also very drought resistant. 
you take drought resistant corn, you take tall corn, and you'd mix it together, right? This is my, this is corn sex happening right here. Sorry. Anyway, and they would produce these new seeds and you would plant them and some of them would have both of the traits. Some of those plants would be drought resistant and tall, right? Whereas many of them wouldn't be. And so you take the ones that did get the right traits and then you breed those together. And then the offspring that also still had the traits you wanted, you breed those together so that you had kind of seeds that reliably created tall drought resistant corn. That's hybridizing, which is very different from genetic modification, which I'll talk about here in a second. But the idea with the Green Revolution initially was you take these hybrid seeds, but they also sometimes required fertilizer and pesticides and all these other inputs, and you bought these, planted them, and then you ended up getting uh, seeds and plants that were much more productive per acre than you had before. So some places like India really kind of grabbed a hold of this. Some countries kind of were skeptical and kind of uh, didn't, didn't uh, adopt them. And yes, production increased. The problem was, was that while production increased, the farmers that were able to afford these new seeds and the pesticides and the other things that went with them started to outcompete other farmers that could not uh, afford these inputs. So what that meant is poor farmers either had to go out of business or poor farmers had to borrow money so that they could then buy all this stuff. And which, by the way, they would buy these things from usually American companies or European companies. And so those companies did very well. But the people that were farmers, if you went into debt or you went out of business, um, and then sometimes if you went into debt, eventually you went out of business, they couldn't stay in the agricultural sector. They essentially lost their income. And so while you had these richer farmers producing a lot, you actually... Uh, didn't have a lot of farmers surviving and then they were broke and often went into the cities like some of the cities in India and some of the slums and became this much larger urban population who could not afford the seat, the food that was being produced. And so in some ways, even though you were producing more, the way it happened meant that through the Green Revolution, a lot of people actually went, drove some people into poverty, um, made it more difficult for people to actually access food because they didn't have income. And then a lot of the extra stuff that was being produced just went on the world market and was sold back into Europe or North America or you know East Asia or these other areas that could afford it. And so the Green Revolution actually had this kind of negative economic impact. Also environmentally, because you were using a lot of water, using a lot of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, it also had this pretty bad uh, environmental impact. The other thing too is that while initially the Green Revolution caused production to go up, it started tapering off. And now in some places, because of the soil depletion, overuse of water, buildup of pesticides and fertilizers, you're now actually starting to see those places lose productivity. And so overall, it's been a little bit of a disaster. All right. And so that's, I already kind of talked about this, the negative aspects of the Green Revolution. Okay. So the next part um, is that after the Green Revolution, they... Uh, scientists started developing the technology not just to um, create hybrid seeds, but to actually go in and change the genetic code of seeds or to take uh, DNA from a completely different species and mix it with these seeds. And this happens both in terms of plants, but also with animals and sometimes taking plant and animal DNA and mixing it together. So for instance, here, this picture of this tomato with a fishtail what this is talking about is there's something called the flavor saver tomato. And what scientists did was they took tomato DNA and they mixed it with the DNA of a flounder fish and mixed it together. And by doing so, they had tomatoes that would stay red and more ripe looking um, through the transportation process. And so therefore uh, could still look good by the time they were sold. And you also get other uh, examples uh, like that where it's cross species. And um, so in terms of just a definition of genetically modified crops, it's plants whose genetic characteristics have been altered through recombinant DNA technology. In other words, you're mixing genetic materials from other species together. Um, and then the other thing too is the businesses that do this are able to patent those new seeds. And so they are the owner of not just the seed itself, but the information, the genetic code itself. So you can't take their seeds, grow your own plants without kind of owing this company for the genetic uh, makeup of those seeds. 
And probably one of the biggest uh, examples of this, what's called Roundup Ready seeds. Uh, Roundup is a type of pesticide and the company Monsanto created these seeds with genetic modifications so that their soybeans particularly, so that their soybeans um, could withstand more Roundup, more pesticide. And so they genetically modified them so that you could use more pesticide to kill everything else around it, but it wouldn't kill their seeds or their, their uh, plants. So they were able to make a profit by selling the seed, but also make a profit by selling the Roundup, which they already owned, and they sold it together as sort of a package. And it also means that you're using a lot more pesticide and all of that. And so um, they've been criticized heavily for the fact that the genetic modification essentially also just is more profitable, but not necessarily more environmentally friendly or even necessarily more productive. And then genetic modification gets a little zany. And there's some examples here, and I use this in the discussion questions, but let me just show you briefly this whole thing about glow-in-the-dark cats. Yes, there are, in fact, glow-in-the-dark cats. Let me show you this here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've been listening to all sorts of stuff. Where's my glow-in-the-dark cats? There we go. Yes. What they did is they took the DNA of cats and they mixed it with uh, jellyfish DNA, jellyfish that glow in the dark, and now you have glow-in-the-dark cats. Uh, never lose your cat again. Okay, so one of the things that's been a controversy with um, genetically modified organisms is whether you tell people that the stuff they're eating has genetically modified seeds or not. In Europe and other places, you do have to say that it has, if, if things have to be labeled. In the United States, uh, we don't. And so, for instance, corn, most of the corn you're going to eat in the U.S. is genetically modified. Um, most of the soybeans are going to be genetically modified and you do not have to label it because the producers claim that there's no difference between a genetically modified seed and a regular one. And this has been a very big controversy. The idea is that it's supposed to boost agricultural production, but um, the long-term uh, effects of this are not necessarily known uh, in terms of also when these genetic uh, mutations or these genetically modified organisms interbreed with natural species and some of that DNA crosses other lines. Um, and there's also a concern that some of the weeds out there will get some of these genetically modified um, DNA uh, and, and also with the extra um, pesticides being used that you'll develop what are called super weeds, things that become basically more resistant to the pesticides through natural selection. So this is very controversial. But the idea is it's supposed to try and address the problem of, of malnutrition, but again, kind of with the same logic of the Green Revolution, which did not turn out all that well. Okay. So just the last couple of things here to wrap up. One is that, of course, as people have been using more pesticides and hybrids and genetically modified seeds, there's also kind of a movement against all that towards organic agriculture. And organic agriculture is a form of farming that relies on not using pesticides, right? Manuring, mulching, biological pest control, rejects GMOs, rejects synthetic fertilizers. Um, and the organic food market is now actually the most rapidly growing and profitable part of the agricultural sector, but it's really driven by consumer choice, by people who don't want, who believe that there may be dangers in the genetically modified crops or the use of a lot of pesticides. Another important point about agriculture is that today a lot of things are grown, not necessarily to eat, but as biofuel. In other words, things are being turned into um, fuel. So like corn, sugarcane, a lot of it is turned into ethanol. If you go to the gas station and you look at your gasoline pump, there may be a thing on there saying that a certain percentage of the gasoline is ethanol. That comes from corn or from sugarcane. And so it means that you have a large area of the, uh, of, of the agricultural land, not necessarily growing food, but growing fuel. And then the last point here in this section is that it's not just the land where we do agriculture. There's also something called aquaculture. And this is the cultivation under controlled conditions of aquatic organisms. So again, this is not fishing or going out and taking fish out of the sea. It's like farming fish. So having a closed in area where you have fish or other kinds of things like shrimp um, and kind of, uh, and again, cultivating it, managing it and, and harvesting it in a very, um, Kind of organized way. So it says here, you know, at the turn of the 21st century, aquaculture was growing nearly four times faster than all terrestrial animal producing sectors combined. And so this is particularly big. This is just an example of this kind of uh, aquaculture uh, where people are farming, uh, you know, things in the in the waters. 
<clears throat> and if you actually look at where a lot of this is happening, a lot of it is happening in Asia, particularly around China, India, um, Southeast Asia, those areas. Okay, that's it for this section. Um, hopefully there's some interesting stuff here for you about agriculture and, and global food systems. And uh, so go ahead and just make sure and get to this discussion questions. All right, thank you.